Amen, and happy Easter Sunday morning to you as we celebrate our Lord's uh, resurrection on that morning 2,000 plus years ago. I'm delighted to have you here with us in our early service, and what a blessing Jeff and the musicians are and the singing. Uh, boy, it kind of takes you right up to the gates of heaven, doesn't it? And uh, what, a, what a blessing. Makes me think when we get to heaven and we uh, hear the angelic choirs and... Uh, and I've had people say before, well, Pastor, I just can't sing. Well, in heaven, you will be able to sing. So uh, we can sing it out and sing, sing loud and, and honor the Lord. Well, let's spend a few minutes this morning and conclude our series as we've been working up toward uh, Resurrection Sunday morning. We'll be in Luke chapter 24 in just a moment if you want to make your way there. Let me just remind you, really, I want to begin by drawing a picture for you in case you're I uh, have never really put all the pieces together of the last week of Christ in our series over the last four weeks. We have been looking at the, the events in the life of Jesus leading up to his crucifixion and then his resurrection. You remember six days before the Passover, and Jesus came to Jerusalem and he would die at the Passover. He was uh, the Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God. And, and so six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany, that little town, uh, a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem, and he met with his friends there. And you'll remember the first in our series, he had a, a meal with them, a, a supper, if you will, and they celebrated him and their friendship. And it was Mary and Martha and Lazarus there, his close friends, and uh, Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And then, of course, uh, Martha serving and Mary anointing Jesus with the oil, uh, really looking forward, if you would, prophetically in many ways to his death on the cross and his resurrection. So they had that meal. And then we remember in our series that Jesus presented himself uh, in Jerusalem, the triumphant entry. He rode in on a donkey. And you'll remember the reason for that is he came as the Prince of Peace the first time. He came as the King of Peace uh, to offer peace to the world. Uh, the Bible says he is the Prince of Peace. And so he rode in on a donkey and he presented himself as the King of the Jews. And of course, they ended up rejecting him. Many of the same people who cried Hosanna, uh, Lord save on that day, uh, rejected him a few days later at the trial because Jesus didn't fit in their box. He didn't fit what they were looking for uh, in a Messiah and a king. And I might just say in passing, there are many people today who won't come to Christ because he doesn't fit what they're looking for. May I say to you this morning, if you're in that category, you say, well, you know, Jesus just isn't my thing. Well, understand this, there isn't any other thing, and you need to come to Jesus the way you are and accept him for who he is because he's the king, and if you come to Jesus, you'll be glad you did uh, because he'll save your soul and give you eternal life. So they rejected Jesus after he presented himself as the Messiah, and you remember Jesus demonstrated really his, his deity and his power and who he is. He went in one day, uh, the next day after the triumphant entry, and went into the temple, and what were they doing in the court of the Gentiles? They were money changing and selling doves and had a, a bazaar going on in there and Jesus uh, cleaned them out, turned the tables over and ran them all off. And it's interesting that uh, while he was doing that, the high priest directly profited from those things. Nobody tried to stop him because in his deity, when he manifested his power, uh, nobody could stop him. And not to mention, uh, Lazarus was walking around uh, the guy had been dead, and Jesus called him out of the grave, and so everybody could see Lazarus and see his power. There should have been no doubt in their mind that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. And then on Thursday of the week, uh, the last week of his life, we didn't have time in our series to go through every single detail, but you'll remember Jesus told uh, the Last Supper together, and Jesus sat with his disciples around the table, and they had a meal together, and he he washed their feet, remember that? He taught them how they should serve one another. And then Jesus said to them again, I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be executed. Uh, I'm going to be handed over to the Romans to die. And the disciples were troubled. They, they couldn't rationalize in their mind how he's the king, and it's his kingdom, and how is he going to die. They couldn't put the pieces together. So uh, John chapter 17, that wonderful encouraging high priestly prayer where Jesus prayed for himself and then he prayed for them and then he prayed for us, for all those who would be saved in the church age. So Jesus let them hear his prayer 
Then he told him one would betray him, and of course it was Judas, and he went out. And then on that evening, it's Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, Jesus then goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, remember that? And he goes there to pray because his heart's heavy, because he's carrying a heavy burden. And you remember three times he fell down in the garden by himself, and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. You might ask yourself, and sometimes people say, what was Jesus praying for? Praying that this cup would pass from him. Did he not come to die on the cross? Sure he did. And that's exactly where he was going. It wasn't the, it wasn't the physical suffering, though that would be very difficult. The beating at the hands of the Jews and the abuse at the hands of the Romans and then the, the, the cross and the crucifixion in such a, an ignominious way to die. That certainly bothered him, but that wasn't why he was asking God, could this cup be taken away from me? You see, Jesus was sinless, always has been, always was, because he's eternally God, the Holy One. And when he went to the cross, what was he going to do for us? He was going to become sin for us. And the thought of, of taking on sin, the thought of, the thought of becoming sin was so repulsive to him in his holiness that he asked the Father, is there any way that we can accomplish the salvation of these people without me having to do this? Of course, the answer was no. And Jesus said to the Father, nevertheless, not my will be yours. Paul explained this thing very clearly in 2 Corinthians 5.21 when he said, for he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might have the righteousness of God. That's what Jesus was struggling over in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, while Jesus was praying, the third time he was praying, Judas had betrayed him. It's still Thursday evening. It's probably after dark. It's a little later in the evening. Judas and the arrest band shows up. And uh, kind of a marvelous thing, Jesus immediately went out in front of his disciples because his disciples would have been considered uh, criminals as well. But Jesus, always protecting his sheep, he went out in front of them and he approached the arrest group who was coming to him with knives and swords and, and spears. And Jesus said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And you remember John tells us in John 18 when he said, I am he, they all went backwards and fell on their face before him. Pretty awesome. They came to arrest him and when he said the I am, which expressed his deity, they couldn't stand before him. Now, I've often said, if I had been in the back of that uh, arrest group with my little spear, and he said, I am, and I found myself on my face, I would decide then I had somewhere else to be and something else to do other than try to arrest the guy that just put me on my face when he said, I am. But the arrest party regathered themselves, recovered, and, and ironically, against all sense, Jesus allowed himself to be bound they tied him up. The guy had just put them on their face. They tied him up and they hauled him away uh, to trial. That was just the beginning of a long night for Jesus. You see, he had six trials throughout the night and into Friday morning. Uh, illegal trials, I might add, under Jewish law. The first thing they did is they took Jesus to Annas, who had been the high priest, but the Romans removed him. But the Jews still recognized him as the high priest, so they took Jesus there for a hearing in the middle of the night. It was against Jewish law to have a trial in the middle of the night, but they did anyway. And then after Annas had interrogated Jesus and accused him of sinful blasphemy, they took him to Caiaphas, who was the high priest that the Romans had put in place, who by instance happened to be the son-in-law to Annas, so it was all in the family. So Caiaphas in, interrogates Jesus, and all along they're abusing Jesus and blaspheming him and, and striking him, which again was illegal under Jewish law. You couldn't strike a prisoner. You couldn't mistreat a prisoner until there was a, 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 a judicial decision that they were either guilty or not guilty, but they didn't care about the law because they hated Jesus so much. And so finally they gathered the Sanhedrin court Friday morning. They rousted all those guys out of bed and called them on their cell phones. No, they didn't call them on cell phones. They, they sent messengers to go get them, and they brought as many of the 70 in as they could, and they had a hearing 
and they found Jesus guilty, the Jewish court did, of blasphemy and said he should die. Well, Herod would hold court, not Herod, but Pilate would hold court early in the morning, so they went immediately to, to Pilate because they couldn't execute Jesus. They didn't have the authority, so they took Jesus to Pilate for the first Roman hearing early in the morning. Now, Jesus has been up all night. He's been abused, slapped around, insulted, blasphemed, had no sleep, no food. They take him before Pilate. Pilate talks to him. Pilate figures out that he belongs to Herod's jurisdiction. So Pilate wants to get rid of the situation. He doesn't want to deal with it, so he sends Jesus to Herod. Well, Herod didn't care anything about the political part of it. He just wanted to see a miracle. So Herod wanted to get Jesus to do something in front of him so he could see a miracle. I don't have time, but Herod is a perfect biblical example of apostasy, of a person who has become an apostate. And you know how I know that? Because Jesus wouldn't talk to him. In other words, that guy had gone down the road so far of rejecting Jesus and rejecting what he knew that Jesus turned him over to his sin. Can I say to you today, don't find yourself in that situation. Don't pursue your sin so far to where God goes fine. Have it your way, and God turns you over to what it is you want to do. Come to Jesus and be saved while you can. So Jesus didn't say anything to Herod. Herod got frustrated and sent him back to Pilate. So the, fast, the last hearing that Jesus had before Pilate, Pilate took him in. You can read about it in the Gospels. Here's Pilate's verdict. Now keep in mind, he's the authority of the land. He represents the Roman government. He has the final word. Listen to Luke 23, verses 13 to 15. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, listen to this, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Pilate declared publicly and openly that Jesus was an innocent man, that he was innocent of all the things they charged him of. Yet, for political expediency, and I don't have time to get into it, Pilate didn't want to lose his job. So he condemned Jesus to death and turned him over to be crucified. Jesus had to endure the beating of a Roman lictor, the abuse, the insults. You can read it in the Gospels. Carried his cross most of the way to Calvary, physically gave way. Another was called in to carry it for him the rest of the way. They nailed Jesus to a cross, and they stuck him up in the air on that cross. Two thieves crucified, one on each side of him. Jesus were seven sayings from the cross. You can read them. And then Jesus dismissed his spirit and he died. Having finished, the last thing he said, it's finished. I've completed the task. And he dismissed his spirit and he died. For the Jews, there was a time crunch. Jesus probably died somewhere around noon, between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon. At sundown, the Sabbath would begin. The Jews had to get those bodies off the cross and get them in the grave before sundown because that's the beginning of the Sabbath day. And they couldn't be up on the cross when the Sabbath day began. So remember the Roman soldiers came to the two thieves who were still alive because crucifixion would sometimes take days for the person to suffer and finally expire. They broke the legs of the two thieves so they would suffocate. So they couldn't hold themselves up and they would die. When they came to Jesus, Jesus was already dead. So they stuck a spear in his side to be sure and the water and the blood ran out. So they took the bodies down. They took Jesus' body and they wrapped it hastily and they put it in a borrowed tomb that had been offered for him to use. Now these tombs were hewn out of a, of a little limestone rock usually, a little cave. Had a shelf in there and they would put the body on that shelf, a little vestibule area where people could stand for a moment. It was crowded in there. And then they would roll a great big stone in front of it in a trough Roll it downhill typically. Gravity always helps. It would roll it over the mouth of the grave, and that would be it. But in Jesus' case, the 
religious leaders knew that Jesus said he was going to be resurrected on the third day. And they didn't really believe that, but they didn't want anybody stealing his body and then going, look, he came back from the grave. So they went to Pilate and secured some Roman guards and they posted them out there and they put a Roman seal on that tomb. Anybody who broke that seal, punishment was death. They put the Roman guards out there so nobody could get in the tomb. The response to Jesus' death was twofold. The religious leaders celebrated. Satan and the demons probably thought they had won. Darkness seemed to have won the day. The Son of God was dead. Among the leaders and followers of Jesus, they were full of consternation and sadness. They couldn't reconcile why Jesus would die and let himself be crucified. But here's the good part. What none of them understood was the stage was now set for the greatest victory ever. All the sadness, all the celebrating and all the victories and all the darkness thinking they had won, all the sadness and consternation of those who followed brings us to Luke 24, verse 1. Look at it with me. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. These ladies came early in the morning on the first day of the week. Now let me explain very quickly. The Sabbath began at sundown on Friday and ran till sundown on Saturday. Saturday was the Sabbath. They couldn't go to the tomb and do anything on the Sabbath day, and they hurriedly put his body in the tomb before sundown on Friday. And yet, because of their love for him, they wanted to properly anoint his body. They wanted to put the spices and the oils on there. And so their intent was to go on their next possible opportunity. Now, it appears that either Friday afternoon or they did what they weren't supposed to do on the Sabbath day. They gathered the materials, and they had it all ready because they intended to go at first opportunity. They couldn't go at sundown on Saturday because it's dark. And they didn't have their flashlight. You guys are, it's early, I know. <laughs> didn't have their cell phone. They couldn't see. Plus there's, they don't want to go to the graveyard in the middle of the night. So first thing, Sunday morning, the first day of the week, first daybreak, they're there. They go because they intend to anoint the body of Christ. Now let me say very quickly, why are these ladies at a graveyard at daybreak? And one word, love. Man, they love Jesus. You say, why did they love Jesus? Because he saved them. If you read the stories of some of those women that their names are given in there, Jesus saved them out of great sin, out of great destruction in their life. And those who have been saved from sin are always grateful. Those who have been saved from sin are always thankful or should be. And so these ladies in gratitude, they come because they want to anoint Jesus and they, they want to honor him. Very quickly, listen to me. It's not enough to say we love somebody, is it? Because words can be cheap. How do we know we really love somebody? By the things we do. You've heard the old saying, the guy said to his wife, I told you I love you when we got married. If I ever changes, I'll let you know. That's not going to fly. That's not going to work. Why? Because every day as a husband, every day as a father, we have to demonstrate our love to our wives and our children. How do they know we love them? Because they see it. It isn't because we say it. My dad used to say, talk is cheap. It's action. It's the things that you do. These ladies, they love Jesus. You know how I know they love Jesus? They got their stuff, and they're at the tomb at daybreak because they want to anoint his body. They want to honor him even in death. You say, how do Christians today show their love for Jesus? I'm glad you asked. How do we show our love for Jesus? You love his word. Man, you spend time reading it. You don't just read it, but you meditate on it. Why? Because the more we know God's word, the more we know about Jesus. And that's the one I want to know about, right? Because I love him. Because he first loved me. How do we show our love for Jesus today? We spend time in his word. We pursue holiness. Can we ever achieve it in this life? Sadly not. But you know what? If you love Jesus, there's this desire in your heart to please him. And God said, be ye holy because I'm holy. 
Man, you want to do what he said? So we pursue holiness. Closely connected to holiness as we pursue obedience to do what God said. If you love somebody, you want to do what they said. If you love Jesus and you're thankful for what he did for you, you want to be obedient to him. So we pursue him. If you love Jesus, you want to serve him. You want to use your spiritual gift. You want to use the resources and the things that God's given you in this life to honor him, to bring glory to him, to do the things he's called us to do. These ladies were moved by love to go and anoint the body of Christ. What do they find when they get there very quickly? They were surprised when they got there. The tomb's wide open, the stone's rolled away, and the body's not in there. Now we know, I'm not going to take time to go back and read it. In Matthew 28, it tells us what happened. The tomb is sealed, it has the Roman seal on it, the guards are out there taking their shifts, guarding this tomb. I've often said, having been in the military, I can only imagine how this went. The centurion comes to them and says, hey, I got special duty for you guys tonight. I want you to guard a grave. They probably thought that was a joke. You mean guard a dead person who's already in the grave? Yeah. I want you to make sure nobody gets in that grave. So they probably weren't real happy about having that duty. But they're out there. They're guarding the grave. They're guarding the tomb. The thing is sealed. The stone's heavy. The ladies probably couldn't have moved it anyway. And who shows up? An angel in the middle of the night. A couple of things about the angel that showed up from heaven. He wasn't worried about a Roman seal because he opened it. Not only did he open it, he sat on top of it. He probably opened it with one hand. Watch this. (laughs) Sat on top of the thing. The Roman guard saw him in the middle of the night. They weren't as tough as they thought they were. The Bible says they passed out in fear. They were paralyzed. And when they came to their senses, when they woke up, they didn't grab their swords to fight. They ran. And they ran back into town to tell what happened. The angel opened the tomb, sat on the stone, and when the ladies get there, that's what they find. Now, why did the angel open the tomb? It wasn't to let Jesus out. The body's missing. Here's what happened. Sometime... Sometime on the first day of the week, sometime in the night, Jesus got up in that tomb in his resurrection body. And he didn't need the door open. He didn't need the rock removed because we found out later that in his resurrection body, he can just walk through things. So he just walked out of the tomb. He didn't need an open door. The angel moved the stone because we're slow. The angel moved the stone because the women are slow. And the men who would come are slow. Peter and John later, they're slow. John, by the way, the one closest to Jesus was the first one to get it. That's a lesson for you. If you want to get it, if you want to understand, get close to Jesus. John didn't get it. Peter didn't get it. John was the first. The women come, they didn't get it. So the angel goes, God the Father must have said to the angel, go down there and open the thing so they'll get it. He goes down and opens the thing. The ladies come, they find the body's gone. Now, what's the resurrection really tell us? Listen, make no mistake about it. There are are heretics throughout the church age who have denied the resurrection and they've made excuses for Christianity and the resurrection. You listen very closely this morning. Jesus physically and literally got up and walked out of that grave. He he arose physically in a resurrected body. He's alive today. And what does it tell us that Jesus is alive? It tells us that he did what he said he would do. It tells us that he paid for our sin on the cross. It tells us that he is who he said he is. It tells us that he's the very God who left heaven and took on human form. It tells us that he won the victory over sin and death. It tells us that he won the victory over the grave. The greatest enemy to humanity is death. We all die. We all get separated from family. We all get separated from loved ones. There's sickness and hurt and pain in the world because there's sin in the world. Sin is the reason we die. 
God told Adam, the day you disobey me, you will surely die. And God's never joking. And God's never kidding. Adam died. And everybody after him has died. Jesus died, but he's the exception. Because they put him in a tomb, and three days later, he got up and walked out. That means he won the victory over sin and over death and over the grave. And Jesus guarantees to us because he walked out of the grave, if you trust him as your Lord and Savior, it means you're going to walk out of the grave one day. You're going to have a body just like his. Let me hit a couple of things real quick before we close. The women were perplexed. Look at verses 4 to 7 real quick. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Verse 5, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, the angel said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hand of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. I like this. The women were perplexed along with everybody else. What happened to the body? Remember, Mary thinks somebody took the body. Later, you'll see her talk. They, they're perplexed. They don't understand what's going on. But the angel said to them, hey, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because he ain't here. And then he said, don't you remember what he said? And the angel brought to their memory what they had heard Jesus say. And then they remembered. And they said, oh, yeah. He said he was going to come out of the grave on the third day. Important point. Listen to me. There are spiritual things that are hard for us to understand because, like I said, we're slow. We, we really are. We are dull when it comes to spiritual things. But watch this. What did the angels do? They said, remember what Jesus said. Well, there's the clue. You, you want to know what's going on spiritually? Read the Bible and you know what the Holy Spirit will do? He'll whisper in your ear and in your heart, remember what Jesus said. Because you got the word, because you read it, because it's in your mind, and because you meditated on it, and God will recall it to you. Let me, let me tell you real quick, and I'm going to close in a moment. Listen to me. The fact that the angel would say, listen to what Jesus said, and believe what he said because he did it. What does that mean to you and me? Well, let me give you a list very quickly. Because Jesus said it, you can believe it. There's a rapture coming one day. And Jesus is going to come back and call his church out of this world. You say, well, I don't know when that's going to happen. Me neither, but it's closer today than it was yesterday. Jesus is coming back. He said he's going to do it, so he's going to do it. Because Jesus said it, it's going to happen. You know, there's going to be a tribulation one day. Seven years of absolute hell on this earth. Seven years of judgment and the wrath of God poured out on wickedness. You know how I know that's going to happen? Because Jesus said it's going to happen. Do you know at the end, he's going to come back at the second coming as king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to bring the army of heaven with him. He's going to set up his kingdom here. And if you're saved, you get to rule in it with him. You know how I know that? Because Jesus said it. You say, where do you find all that stuff in that book right there? Do you know that at the, at the end of his kingdom, judgment day is coming. Somebody here this morning, somebody who's listening on, online or watching online, you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ and you're lost. Listen to me. Jesus said judgment day is coming, the great white throne judgment. You say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, they didn't believe in the resurrection either, but he's out walking around. So the judgment's coming. Jesus said it so you can believe it. And then there's an eternity out there, a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and living with Jesus forever and ever and ever in perfect fellowship with the God who created us. You say, how can you be so confident? Because the Jesus who got up and walked out of that tomb, like he said he would, is the one said all that other stuff's going to happen too. You can believe a lot of things in life, dear ones, but unless you believe in Jesus, it's all in vain. Unless you trust in him, it's all empty. Let me draw it to a close. The title of the message, by the way, was looking in the wrong place. The women went to the tomb looking in the wrong place for Jesus, didn't they? They went there looking in the wrong place. Where are you looking today? Where are you looking today? You're looking in the world to satisfy all your felt needs. Felt needs are worth nothing, by the way. Our needs are what God say they are, not what we feel like they are. 
Are we looking in the world to solve all our problems? Are we looking in the world to make us feel better? Are we looking in the world to make us feel better about ourselves? Are we looking in the world to find some kind of peace in our heart that we would feel like we're all right or going in the right place when we die? You're not going to find it out there in the world. You're going to find it in Jesus Christ if you want it. The one who went in the tomb, paid for our sin on the cross, went in the tomb, and rose again on the third day. Today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These women came to be the first witnesses. They gave testimony. We have the testimony of the angels who said he isn't here, he's gone. We have the testimony of more angels outside, he isn't here, he's gone, he arose like he said. Did you know Jesus appeared that very day to his disciples in the upper room in his resurrection body? Thomas skipped Sunday night church. He saw he did because he didn't see Jesus. The next Sunday, Jesus is in there again. Thomas is back. Thomas said, I ain't believing unless I see him and put my hands on the side. The next Sunday, Jesus comes in and Thomas is there and Jesus said, Thomas, come here. Put your hands right here. Feel my hands right here. Listen, Jesus came out of the grave. Paul said Jesus was seen of above 500 people at one time. That means 500 plus people heard Jesus teach in his resurrection body and saw him. The disciples shared a meal with him in his resurrection body. That's incredibly encouraging. That means Jesus could eat in his resurrection body. And I think our resurrection body don't worry about calories. They don't care. So you can eat whatever you want. You get all the banana pudding you want, and it won't hurt your resurrection body. They saw Jesus. They touched him. They heard him. They recognized him in his resurrection body. What's the final conclusion today? Jesus came out of the grave in a resurrected body. A lot of people have died in, in the history of humanity. Matter of fact, it's 100%. Nobody gets out of it. Jesus is the only one in all of humanity to conquer death. That proves who he is. Nobody else can do it. And because Jesus conquered death and the grave and sin and all of its penalties, he can offer salvation to you and me. It's by Jesus Christ, by faith in him, that he forgives our sin. It's by faith in Jesus Christ that our sin is not only forgiven, but he gives us his righteousness, adopts us into his family. Easter Sunday morning is a great time to recognize who Jesus is and to trust him by faith and be saved. If you're here this morning and you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ, would you seriously consider doing that right now? Would you trust the one, the only one, who's ever come out of the grave would you trust the one, the only one who won the victory for you and me? Would you trust him this morning to save you? You say, how do I do that, Pastor? In a moment when I pray, here's what you do. You pray right there in your seat. God, I'm a sinner and I know it. The Bible says for all of sin, Jeff read it. Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner and I believe you died for me to pay for my sin. Lord Jesus, I believe you're alive today and sitting at the right hand of the Father just like this book says. God, I confess my sin. Would you come into my heart and save me? Jesus said, anybody who will call on his name, he'll save him. Would you do that this morning? Let's pray. Father, what an incredible thing we celebrate today, that Jesus would die for us on the cross, that his body would be placed in a tomb and on the third day raised from the dead and walks out of there. God, thank you that your resurrection is our resurrection. Your payment for sin pays for our sin. God, this morning, if there's a man or a woman, young person, boy or girl who has never been saved, in this moment right now, Lord, I ask you to draw them and save them. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. You come, if I can pray with you this morning, you come on the first verse. All to Jesus I surrender all. To him I freely give, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily.
thank you for coming to the early service. If you pray to receive Christ this morning, would you just come by and tell me, let me know. I want to rejoice with you. Tell Jeff, find somebody before you leave and say, hey, man, I pray to receive Jesus today. So we'll rejoice with you. If this is your first time, thank you for coming. Hope you'll come back and be with us again. No service tonight. Enjoy the day with your family. Anything else? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, for what we celebrate, what we rejoice. Bless your people 